The bravest are surely those who have had the clearest vision of what is before them, glory and danger alike, and yet, notwithstanding, go out and meet it. Theusididis. <laughs> How do you pronounce that? Theusididis. Theusididis. I believe it's uh, Thucydides. Thucydides. But, uh, yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, episode 19 of Commoners Honing All Disciplines. And uh, I'll probably continue reading the quotes from now on. (laughs) 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 But uh, yeah, welcome. This episode is going to be all about fear and finding freedom from fear. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about what it means to be afraid and um, what is the nature of courage. That so should be a good one. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about fear and like, you know, not being afraid to mess up a name when, it's, when, the, <laughs> podcast, when the podcast is going live, you know, not being afraid to just you know mess up a little name here or there. Yeah, you know. Uh, that's that's part of it. It's just like, it's not, not. I'm not gonna say not caring, but just not taking it so seriously. You just gotta relax a little bit. Yeah, the reality of the situation is, uh, is you're you're not perfect. Like if you're listening to this podcast, you're definitely not perfect. If you're making this podcast, you're definitely not perfect. So <laughs> you know you really shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. Even these small, these small little. Uh, the Cydides. See, you learn. That's how you learn. That's a cool mm-hmm. name, man. We got to bring back these like Greek names. Um, I agree. But anyways, what is fear? Why does it happen to us? Why do we have so much of it? Why do we have anxiety? Like that's what we call little, I guess, little fears today. Anxiety is stupid, mm-hmm. but we all have it in a, in its own way. People have it about so more true. serious things, right? They have anxiety about finances. They fear about, uh, you know, not being financially secure. It's a reasonable fear. You know, you want to take care of a family. You want to take care of your children and you can't afford it. Well, good luck. And that's very scary. Very scary situation to be in. But there are stupid things to be afraid of. Stacy didn't respond to your Instagram DM. <laughs> Who cares, it's man? <laughs> it's not over. There's like a billion, there's like three billion Stacys. <clears throat> Don't worry, man. You're finding the needle in the haystack. Don't worry about the haystack, okay? That's the best way I can put that, essentially. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about one woman. Worry about the one you're going to marry. That's A, very a lot of people act. probably get afraid, would be more afraid if she did message back. Then they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> now the now the uh, devil really comes out to play when you when you have to face the true reality of your situation. It's like, mm-hmm. oh shit, this girl this girl could actually be into me. Oh, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I'm gonna screw it all up. And it's like, yeah, and who cares? Really, you care about one chick? Is she that important to you? Well, she is. You better do something about it. If not, then. You know, move on. Who cares? Mm-hmm. But uh, anyways, women should not be the thing you're afraid of. Realistically, that's kind of cringe, bro. They can't <laughs> even hurt you. They statistically no. can't and won't even hurt you. So I don't know what you're afraid of. Your itty bitty, yeah, your itty bitty heart can handle rejection. I promise you. The more it happens, the easier it'll be too. So get it fast and get it early. Um, Mm. anyways, what is fear? Fear, as we come to know, is a response to a risk of danger, to risk or a threat of actual danger. It started off as like being afraid you're going to die, right? Being afraid someone's going to come and kill you. Not in that terms, but being afraid, let's say as the hunter gathers would have been of being mauled to death by a bear or a lion or a woolly mammoth or being charged by a rhino, you know, real, reasonable, scary things to be afraid of. 
Um, but they are perce perceived. The important thing to know about fear is it's all perceived. If you fought 10 lions, chances are you're not as afraid of lions as you used to be when you fought the first one. Mm -hmm. If you slayed <clears throat> 10 dragons, that 10th dragon will probably be afraid of you at some point. It reminds me of a, a gladiators, right? Like, how, how little fear did a gladiator have at some point? When they were just on the top of their game and they would wreck everyone and anything that came into the ring, even though they knew they could be like certain death could just still happen at any time. You got to think like these are probably some of the, no, I won't say brave necessarily because brave implies the overcoming of fear. Right. And if you're not afraid, well, you technically can't be brave. Um, well, but I will say the ones who lack the most fear potentially ever in society are probably these people uh, from a, from a human standpoint. I'm not talking about. I'd obviously go beyond and say martyrs, right? Where their where their fear was so little because their love of God was so much that it was almost negligible, right? Um. But yeah, what what does it mean to be afraid, and how do we overcome that? Where does it come from, right? It's it's very human to be afraid. It's very human to sense danger uh, and be anxious about things. You know, we have a response to the, it. Uh, <clears throat> the thing about the gladiators, they were uh, they weren't allowed to just like they weren't free, so they they had to fight. They were just kind of thrown in the ring with a lion, and it's like now you're in a do or die situation. You can't run away, so you might as well learn how to fight a lion at that point. Or yep, fight exactly. whoever's trying to kill you in that situation. That's a good metaphor, actually. That's a good metaphor. It's you can't escape. It's the lion or it's mm. you. Either you, you, you get eaten by the lion or you become the lion. That's yeah, I think if people put that into practice in their daily lives, like it's kind of like it's the same thing as the, the burning the boats analogy. Um like Hernan Cortez, he wanted to motivate his men. Mm -hmm. So he burned all the boats and said, well, he actually burned all but one. And then they said, okay, anyone who is a coward and wants to go back to Spain can go, but the rest of us are going to stay here and conquer the new world. And none of them left. They all agreed to burn the last boat. So with that, having no other option, they were all motivated forward. Just despite whatever fears they had, it was all overcome because they had no nothing to go back to. And I think um, if you're like a gladiator, there's nowhere to run. But if you have somewhere to run to, mm -hmm. then you're going to justify running away from your fears. But what you should realize is that you can only run for so long and everything eventually catches up. So... You should think about it in your mind that I'm not going anywhere and I'm going to actually sit here and face face the fears before they get worse. Because if you keep running, it's just going to get worse and worse. Exactly right. You Either once faced with discomfort, you have a choice, right? Because, because in reality, a lot of the things we're afraid of are not anything to actually be afraid of. They're literally just things that make us more uncomfortable than other things tend to make us. So what do we do with that? Well, the easiest thing that we can do with that is essentially say, I'm willing to be uncomfortable right now so that it can be even more comfortable in the future. And at the end of the day, you do have to put it on the line and say, I'm willing to be afraid for a little bit. You have to be willing to be afraid because if you're not afraid, you can't be courageous. And if you're not courageous, you can't be a hero. And if you can't be a hero, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of living? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? There's so many, you know, the most of the pop culture heroes that we really have today. And you look at the most popular ones, you have, you know, Batman, um, Spider-Man, he said Spidey Sense, right? That's that immediate fear, right? It's the immediate call to action when he gets that Spidey Sense. 
you have, you know, Superman, right? You'll have Luke Skywalker. You'll have, I don't know, I haven't watched pop culture stuff in so long. You can have anti-heroes. <laughs> you can have, like, Wolverine, right? Where mm-hmm. it's like, he still has to feel all this pain. He knows he won't die, but it's still difficult what he has to do most of the time. Um, I'm just trying to think, like, who's, like, the most popular... Man, I really Batman. haven't watched a lot of stuff in so long. I said Batman. <laughs> I haven't oh, watched this stuff in so that's... long. Yeah, I mean, neither have I, but Batman's yeah, you know an I mean. anti-hero. Well, he's no, he's a real hero, but it's like, the idea is like, you know, he had to face his fear when he was a kid. He, he had to live a life without his parents. He had to live a life, mm-hmm. although in, in luxury, in constant discomfort, right? Like the idea of having parents is safe. Or even if you have bad yeah, parents, it's, true. it's more safe to have someone you can go home to and rely upon in, in some manner, right? And with his example, you know, he had, he was like the ultimate Chad. He's like the ultimate guy everyone looks up to, right? Where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, regardless of his wealth, he still like put in a shit ton of work to get his body for to where he wanted to be. Um, did things that were high risk and high reward, right? Like uh, if you follow his story, I guess we'll go from the Dark Knight story. I think that's the most familiar to everyone. And, yeah. You know, that, that sort of franchise story. It's the best. You know, he falls into the cave of bats at some point and he says, well, what am I going to do with this cave? And I have an idea. And he, he brings that idea. He fleshes it out to its fullest reality. He, he trains his body. He trains his mind. He trains his soul. Right, he trains his mm-hmm. morals. He he essentially says, "I'm choosing not to kill. I would literally rather die than kill." However, I am not going to make it easy for someone to kill me, regardless of that being possible. I'm going to make it very difficult for them to kill me. Right. So he does all that. He flushes it out. He goes to the belly of the beast. Right. He goes to what is it, Rachel Ghoul, the League of Shadows, to to learn yeah. from the best killers in the world right he fights a ghost essentially in Ra's al Ghul who comes back to haunt him in multiple ways in multiple ways right it's a, it's like a constant that's a weird True. fear right where it's like this could come back this thing that was so evil could come back and, and cause me to you know have to face it again how am I going to be prepared for it and obviously with the you have the unpredictability and chaos of the Joker in the second one and why so serious <laughs> you know how i got these scars? these scars <laughs> um but yeah you have unpredictability right and there's a f- there's a big fear in unpredictability batman knows what rachel ghoul can do um he knows what he'll try to do he does not know what joker will do he does not know his motivations mm-hmm. he knows very little about him he doesn't even know his, we don't even find out his origins he kind of just appears nope. in the second one right ready to wreak havoc and, you know that's the wolves at your door right they're ready to go are you ready to face them that's the real question he he the joker is such a character he he corrupts He's pure chaos, essentially, right? He's the form yeah. of pure chaos as an archetype. He corrupts the best of us, right? He corrupted Harvey Dent. He, he created a two-faced individual. He created someone who, rather than would decide based on morality, which he was attempting to do as Harvey Dent, he changed him completely and said, you are actually now going to live as I do, based on chaos, based on chance. And that changed his whole life because he wasn't ready. Harvey Dent was not mm-hmm. ready for the Joker. Batman was barely ready for the Joker. And he was definitely not ready for Bane. No. And that showed in that movie. It showed what happened when he wasn't ready for the for the reality of what Raish al, al Ghul's ghost could do. That's his name, right? Raish al Ghul? Yeah, it is. I played the Arkham yeah. game. I played the Arkham <laughs> games. They're pretty, they're pretty good. They're very good. Um, mm-hmm. I agree. But, you know... I think Batman is one of the best examples of fear and how to overcome it. Uh, maybe not in the healthiest way, but in a good way, at least. Like, he was, he was one, really uh, good. One thing that's really interesting about Batman is that he's afraid of bats since he was a kid. And then <laughs> he becomes a bat. He essentially becomes the thing that he's most afraid of. Yeah. 
and that's like and I, his that's his strength is the fact that he has taken the thing he's afraid of and have now embraced it and become it yeah and it's I kind of the like, idea the, is like the dragon story mm -hmm. well you you must become a monster in order to destroy them essentially mm -hmm. i think that's a very it's so simple like it's so simple right it's like oh you must become a bat to no longer fear the bats and i think actually in the first movie we didn't really talk about his villain which was scarecrow ironically enough and scarecrow's whole idea is essentially poisoning people and showing them their worst fear so they would mm -hmm. be the worst version of themselves that seems to be a recurring theme in batman is the villain constantly wants to make gotham the worst version of itself right it's very clear with the scarecrow he wants them he wants fear to control people right we know that's not a good thing fear should never control your decisions you know joker on unpredictability and chaos causes that fear of the unknown right the fear of chaos rather than embracing mm -hmm. an understanding of it so it can be ordered right and destroyed and again, that idea is he wants to make Gotham the worst way possible, still using fear, but in a different type of fear, not individual's fear, but just the fear of the unknown, which affects us all. And then Bane comes in and trying to make Gotham its worst version of itself, even though mm -hmm. the project that they were working on in the movie was essentially to power the entire city with completely renewable energy. That's a pretty good idea. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, but the risk of that renewable energy was so high, it could have destroyed the city. And, and they, they again, Bane, the idea of, I think Bane has the idea of like absolute power corrupts mm -hmm. absolutely because Bane himself was such a powerful uh, individual. He was more powerful than the Batman, right? He may not have had the same amount of funds, but he had more resources. He had men willing to die for him at a moment's notice that is power if i've ever mm -hmm. seen it to have men fall at your will at any time for you is power right so i think bane is the embodiment of like the fear of absolute power right what absolute power can do it can do all the things that that scarecrow does it can do all the things that joker does it is the thing that we should be most afraid of arguably mm -hmm. is if someone has complete power over us, if someone can be so powerful and so absolutely corrupt that they can hold us tyrannically to their standard. And we can't let that, you know, determine what we do with our lives. Right. And we, again, we've spoken about the, the truckers in Ottawa. We've spoken about them before. And the whole idea of that is that these individuals are not going to let fear control them they're not going to let fear make them act like animals either they refuse no. to be in the prison in which it seems the government is trying to put them in they I, refuse uh, to I be saw, in the mental prison i saw a good video the other day maybe just yesterday actually and it was one of the truckers and they asked him well what are you going to do if they take away your truck and take away your insurance he's like whatever it's a, it's a material possession why would i care freedom is more important so oh, i'm yeah. gonna stay and i was like man i love these guys yeah that's, that's exactly what it's about right there like he's not afraid he's not he's not gonna back down he's just gonna hold the ground for something that he deems as his higher value right yeah like freedom the the idea that like people you know, across time, like across all time, have been willing to essentially give up their own lives such that someone else could be free, essentially in their place. You know, that, I think that is the ultimate denial of fear. To be mm. like, I trust my sacrifice so much. I trust it so much that it won't be in vain enough that it will eventually create freedom for someone else. For someone else to enjoy that freedom it is this idea of this ultimate selflessness right that is the true the truest denial of fear is the idea that or the willingness to sacrifice yourself for others i think because you also yeah. don't fear you don't fear the future right you don't fear the unknown you say i'm willing to risk my life my whole life my death on the potential 
not even the truth sometimes. Sometimes you're just fighting in a, in a war that could be even a lost cause. And, yeah. and brave men, brave soldiers, and brave women at times are more than willing to give up their lives, especially mothers. You see that in mothers a lot. You see a True. lot of mothers standing up at the Freedom Convoy. It's, it's very obvious that they are mothers. They worry about their children's future. And they have absolutely every duty and right to. And I'm more disappointed that fathers aren't standing up and aren't as vocal as these women mm. are. It's quite honestly embarrassing for men right now. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> come on. Step it's up. I'm calling them out. I'm calling you out. You're a bitch. <laughs> You're a little bitch. <laughs> your mom, if your mom has more courage than you, dude, Bruh. you're a little bitch. Straight up. No holds bar. True. All I'm calling you out. If you think your mother has more courage than you, get more courageous. Be more courageous. If she can do it, you're her son. You can do it too. I promise you. And don't let her stop you either. <laughs> That's the other important. Yeah, that's thing. another thing. Stop you. Right? The, the smothering mother archetype. Yeah, yeah the, the Oedipal mother where she benefits from your weakness. You know, don't let that mm-hmm. happen. You don't have to be rude. We can do like a whole, whole other episode of that too. Yeah, probably. we definitely will. We're going to put that in our pocket, right? But we can't let fear trap us in a mental prison, in a physical prison, right? How do people become great athletes? I, and I'll especially relate to like, um, you know, higher risk sports. So Formula One, uh, X Games type of activities, you know, stuff rock with climbing, some danger. Stuff with like... immense danger. Yeah. How do the people become the best at those? Is they forego fear for the chance that they may be glorious. Right. I think that brings us to a poem that we wanted to read and we'll do another one as well. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they... Do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned, too late, they grieved on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on that sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears. I pray, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. That poem was by Dylan Thomas. Mm Mm-hmm. I think one one line that really stuck out to me is, is the line about the father. Could you repeat that line? The uh, the father on his sad height. Yeah, and you, my father, there on the sad height. Hmm. Uh, so obviously, basically, it's old English, right? the, Yeah, the the poem is about um, the man's father is he's on his deathbed, mm-hmm. and he's kind of pleading with him to you know, not just die, you know, he wants him to fight against that urge to die that when people talk about going into the light or striving towards the light, just at the, the end of your life there, he wants him to, as he says, rage against the dying of the light. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this actually could, this actually brings us to a whole nother idea of fear and the idea of like the transmutation of uh, energy, the transmutation of emotion. If you've ever read the book, Think and Grow Rich, um, the author talks about the idea of the transmutation of like sexual energy into 
uh, into use more useful and pro- productive items. So, for example, I think Mike Tyson um, never, never, never had sex before fights. Right? He didn't. He he almost wanted to keep that energy, that potential. I don't, I don't know, but that spark, right? He wanted to keep that passion and he wanted to transfer it into something greater. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of other fighters as well during their training camps are like, no, no, nothing, no, uh, no sex of any kind, no any no sexual activity. They put everything that could potentially be um, ener- energetic. They want to put it all towards that one goal the one training camp, right? It's, it's the final battle. It makes sense, right? Because soldiers, you know, how many opportunities do soldiers have to do that before they go into their final battle? So if you think about it, you know, you should put every energy into the most important battles of your life. And that is all other forms of energy. But where am I going with this? What is fear? Fear comes from within. It doesn't come from without. We, we sense danger. We see it. And we feel mm-hmm. fear. The danger is real outside. But the fear is in our hearts. It's in our minds. It's in our souls. So what can we do to, one, mitigate fear, right? And, two, transfer it into something greater. And I think the biggest wow. example of this for people is the fear of failure the fear of I am going to fail this endeavor that I want to do with all of my being. I want to do this endeavor, but I, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. So I'm not going to do it. Oh man. How many men die from the fear of failure? Probably they let it kill them. They let it fester their whole life. And they said, what if, what if I wasn't afraid? What if I could have done what I wanted to do? I could have raged against the dying light, right? What is, because the dying light, okay, it happens on the deathbed. But you don't think that's a habit? You don't think mm. that's a habit of you being comfortable with, with not succeeding and not failing? We don't think that's a habit of, oh, I'm, I'm not afraid, but I just, you know, I don't want to do this. It's like, no, you're, you're cowering from yourself. You're cowering mm. from potentiality. It's like and just I coasting see. through life. It's it's basically just letting things happen to you, being a passive individual versus actively making decisions and making things happen. Mm-hmm. And I say, for those of you who will allow fear to prevent them from reaching their full potential, I hope I never meet you. Oh. I don't want to know you. I don't want to be friends with you. I don't want you as my best man. I don't want you as my godfather. I don't want you at my deathbed. I don't want a deathbed, to be honest, but very likely I'll have one. But I don't want you there. I want to be someone who is unwilling to allow fear to prevent him from doing the things that he wants to do, especially things that are good, even though they may be more difficult And I do not want anyone in my life, I don't want anyone around me to influence me to do things or not do things because I'm afraid. So if you meet me and you're that person, just know I don't want to be your friend until you are, until you are that person. This is the reality. Everyone has the potential to not be afraid inside of them. Everyone has the potential to rise up out of their own comfort and to allow discomfort to occur in order for them to be greater. I mean, what we want to help you reach that potential. That's the whole point, right? It's, I don't want to know you as you are now. I want to know you as you're becoming who you could be. And I, I want to know myself in the same way because... Again, if you're making this podcast, well, God knows that you're not perfect and you should know it too. And if you're listening, we know, trust me, we know. And if you're listening, well, you're definitely not perfect either because you got to listen to to two other schmucks who aren't perfect. So, you know, 
We're all losers in our own way, I guess. But we don't have to stay that way. We don't have to stay as losers who are afraid of going outside and facing the world for as it is. Yeah, a lot of things suck right now. Like a lot of things suck right now. The world is on a weird trajectory, especially if you live in North America and Europe. The West seems to be on a bad collision course with hyper individuality and not the good kind, the bad kind, the unreliant, unreliable, dishonest and delusional sort of individuality. The one that doesn't care much for God and doesn't believe in it at all in any way. Am I afraid? No. I wouldn't say I'm afraid of the result of that. I know that's reality. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be quite disgusting, I can assume. But I'm not afraid of the outcome. What I'm more afraid of is me not being able to live out my part in this play. Mm. My part against what could be and, and what may be. That is what I'm, I'm afraid of. And that's reasonable. I think that's a reasonable fear to say, I'm, I'm afraid I will not live up to my potential or even attempt to. I think that's more, that's more, uh, more of a fear for me. And it sucks. Interesting. But you don't want to be, you don't want to be that guy from saving private Ryan who just sits on the stairs while the other guy is fighting that sniper. Yeah. Remember that scene? Yeah. I know the scene. That scene down. just makes me like, it makes me cringe, but it's yeah. like, because I am also so afraid of just being that guy. Like, yeah. I'm trying to, like, promise myself every day I won't be that guy. I will charge into battle. I will not be a coward. Yeah, there's, there's you know, the meme where it's like, there's two wolves inside of you. Um, <laughs> you know, and they're both, and they're gay. both, and they're both gay. <laughs> 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 but, um, no, uh, there's two wolves inside of you, right? And the idea is, like, you have two conflicting potentialities, right? Every single decision you make, this all break it down. Every single decision you make has two potential two potential outcomes, right? And and they're they're pretty broad, they're pretty vague. But they have two potential outcomes. One outcome feeds the better side of yourself. It makes you stronger, more courageous, it makes you um less afraid of your convictions, less afraid of the consequences of your convictions, especially today when having certain convictions can literally ruin your life potentially. But again, how good is life? How good can life be when the people who ruin your life have shitty ones to begin with? So again, I tell you be courageous because we have to look at the standard in which people who are, who would tend to ruin your life, look at themselves and it's not the greatest. So we have to be confident in ourselves and say, I'm not afraid of these people who would attempt to ruin my life. I wouldn't do it to them because they've already done it to themselves. Those That's are the so men true. I'm talking about. Those are the ones I, I don't pity at all. I'm disappointed in. And I can be one. The point is that we both can be one. We all can be one. It's are we willing to look at ourselves and say, I'm not going to be this guy today. I'm not going to be him tomorrow. <clears throat> I'm not going to be him in five years from now, 10 years from now. I'm going to be a guy who is courageous and is not afraid to stand up. Is not afraid to tell the truth. Is not afraid to get into the weeds with people and be patient, right? That's the other thing. People think, you know, not being afraid and being courageous means being an obnoxious douchebag. And sometimes it is. Mm. But we'll say sometimes it True. is. Sometimes you need to get in someone's face and say, hey, man, you're full of crap. I think this is what you need to hear right now. So I'm going to say it. And and sometimes you need to be patient, methodical, you know, tactical, think like very thinking, thinking oriented, uh, predictive in the way you speak, in the way you relate to others. So in that sense, you need to know what, what causes you to be and feed the best version of yourself. And allowing fear to dictate any of that will not feed anything good. I think I was watching um, a little clip on t Twitter today from Jordan Peterson. He was saying, you know, who is the ultimate predator to each of us? 
and it ends up being the one that's inside of all of us, right? The one that tells you, don't work out today. You're fine. You're fine the way you are. Uh, you know, don't read today. You're smart enough. Don't, don't, um, you know, tell your mom, I love you. She knows already. You deserve that. You deserve that donut. Yeah. Fatty. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's always that voice inside of you that's b- literally, literally yeah. and figuratively bringing you down. It wants to bring you down. And it's not that bad. It is a predator. But it is a predator. You need to know how to use that voice and to say, oh, I can I can actually listen to the voice right now because I've, I've, I've earned it. I've earned. You set your standard for yourself. If you're, like I said, we have to do it based on our individuality. So if I've been working out three hours a day and... I say, oh, my standard is four. Well, I didn't earn it yet. That's pretty extreme. But you say, if I walk half an hour today, I can treat myself with like a, a whatever, a snack that I like. Mm. Do it. Go and earn it. If you're going to eat the snack anyways, you might as well earn it, right? If you're not there yet, right? But if you're at a point where you can say, you know, oh, I was supposed to work out today and I didn't, maybe I'll lay off the, the little bag of chips I was going to have later. Maybe I'll lay off the donut i was gonna have i'll lay off that that beer i usually have after work because i I didn't really earn it and you shouldn't have shame in in saying you know i i just wasn't as good as i could be today you have to learn to accept that very quickly and if you don't learn to accept it very quickly well you're going to be very disappointed in yourself and that shame that you put on yourself for for not fulfilling your own let's say personal standards because people can have unrealistic standards, right? Like I'm trying to lose weight right now and it's not going very well. It's not been going at a rate that I'd like it to be. It's happening. I promise you it's happening, but it's not the rate at, a, at which I want it to happen. And I say to myself and I'm going, okay, I'm not going to beat myself up over this. I'm simply going to change my strategy. Is it, is it diet that's the problem? I, I need to change my diet then. Is it exercise that's a problem? I think it is actually exercise that's a problem lately. So I need to start simply getting off my ass mm. and exercising and not being distracted. And sometimes that means being uncomfortable, making a schedule every morning, right? Taking time out of your day to, oh, I was going to go on you know my social media this morning. I was going to go on TikTok, but no, I have to sit down and make this. It literally takes five minutes, by the way, especially when you get really good at it. You make your daily schedule and you say, I'm going to do this at this time, this at this time, um, and get it all done. Mm-hmm. And, they, and it's I the little fear. Schedules. Yeah, the making schedule is important, but it's it's the little fears. I think I want to highlight it's the little fears that will kill you in in the day-to-day. It's not these big, sweeping, massive monsters, the idea of what am I going to do with my life? What career am I going to have? You know, is, is that career going to pay, pay me well for the rest of my life? Is this the woman I'm going to marry? Those are large qualms, right? Those are large risk, large fear. But there's the little things. Oh, I'm not going to brush my teeth before I go to bed tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to check my phone for five minutes longer than I should. Oh, I'm going to not go on a walk today. I feel like watching Netflix more. Oh, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna half-ass this project at school because it's really oh, it's it's just it's for such a small percentage. I don't need to put that work into it. Mm. Oh, I'm gonna binge this TV show. I'm not gonna visit my grandparents this week. I'm not gonna help my mom or dad with something because I just don't feel like it. And it's like it's that little need to stay comfortable that kind of kills us. Slowly but surely, kills us. You're because you're feeding that predator. You're feeding the thing inside you that doesn't want you to succeed because it doesn't want you to fail. It's like a, it's like a child. It's like a little kid, right? It's like, Oh no, why do I have to do this thing? It it could hurt. And it's like, yeah, but it could be awesome, dude. Little guy could be Mm -hmm. pretty cool if we did this thing and you can say to yourself and go, okay, let's test. Let's just test it out. Right. If you're afraid, let's just test it out. Right. Like let's say you really like a girl at school. Right. I'm going to break it down to like you call it your high school, you're in college, you're at work. Right. You want to you want to talk to a certain girl that you think is attractive, you think would be a good person to date. Instead of talking to her. Talk to someone else that you think, oh, she's kind of cute. She's not as attractive, but, you know, I could see maybe there's potential there. 
try talking to them first. Because if they reject you, you can say, well, I actually didn't care as much, right? But if it goes well, well, then it goes well. And, and what have you lost? And maybe you'll have the courage to say, well, I don't actually want this. I was willing to try this. So why shouldn't I try talking to the girl that I really do like or I like more? I'm more attracted to, I think is a better like, potential person to date for me. You have to be ready to be rejected. You have to be ready to accept the danger of your fear before you can actually attempt to overcome it, right? And again, it's that practice, right? You slay 10 lions, you know, the 11th lion, it's, it's not much. It's not, it doesn't seem as big as the first lion, right? It looks like a little kitty cat to you and, and you're probably stronger and you're probably bigger. You're more tough. You understand their movements better and you go, yeah, this is a joke to me. This is a big joke to me. But it doesn't mean you should under, underestimate the lion. It just means it's more predictable for you. And this is the same with fear. The more you let it fester inside of you, the less likely you're going to face that lion. I think that's um, that's where courage comes in. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, a lot of people of like, do uh, get get high standards of themselves. Like that's something I I think I do. Uh, or people tell me that I do. They're like. And you're really, uh, really hard on yourself for that or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I have to be. So I don't know what uh, the solution is because I, I mostly do meet my standards even though they're high. That's, that's interesting. That's the, uh, that's the thing. And yet you still... But if I... I'm actually curious about that because I, I, I don't know if I'm like that anymore, but I kind of used to be like that. Now I'm a bit less hard on myself, but... Maybe it's not working as well, clearly. So maybe I'm doing something wrong, but I'm actually curious about that. I'm curious about that. So what, so in your brain, what the heck happens when you're like, I met my standard, you know, and then you still are like, mm-hmm. it's not enough. Is that what happens? Is that what you feel like? I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, yeah. Like the baseline is I meet my standards. If I don't meet the standards, then I'm upset. So yeah, it's of like, course. Like I didn't, I didn't work out today. Even if there was something I couldn't control that prevented it, I'm like, mm-hmm. man, I'm 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 not happy about that. And uh, I'll usually, I'll usually try to make everything my own fault, not in like a, like a just to beat myself up kind of way, but just to like always have a personal growth. Uh, goal so it's like even though that wasn't technically my fault like what could i have done to have been prepared for it at least yeah right like i think that's that's along the lines of like the extreme ownership mindset too right like yeah i think that's what it's called um the idea where it's like well maybe it wasn't my fault that this happened but how can i prevent it from happening next time kind Mm -hmm. of thing or, or happening ever again right or even even prevent it at all from happening in the first place and it's good, but the problem with it is what happens when you co- you continuously do not meet your expectations? How do you accept that? And that's why I think the number one thing yeah. to, begin, to begin improving in any way, right, is to understand your strengths and weaknesses right in the beginning. Like that self-awareness, the awareness of like, what do I do well? What don't I do well? How can I bring these two things together. How can I strengthen my strengths and make my weaknesses such that they don't affect my strength? Cause some things we just can't change about ourselves. Right. Yeah. So that's, and it all has to be based on reality. All of the, anyone who has problems with like self-esteem or whatever, there's two types. Like you could either have problems with it because you're actually are recognizing problems or you could just be like over analyzing and like, like, oh, I'm so ugly, I, I'm so fat, but you're not <laughs> actually that that bad. No. But you're just like being so hard on yourself. Or there's like you're actually like in reality, you're like, man, I need to lose weight, and then you actually just go do something about it yeah, instead exactly. of just being in your own head with the the pity party. And it's like, oh, I'm so ugly, I'm so <laughs> no one's ever gonna want me, blah blah blah. 
which gets you nowhere. It's like spinning your wheels, basically. Yeah, and you don't want to spin your wheels. Like, and the way I think about it too is like, well, okay, maybe I'm ugly, but am I the ugliest person on the planet? No. So there's probably something I could do about that. Am I? Am I fat? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe I. Maybe I'm a little fat, but I'm the most fat person on the planet. Well, no. So then, why? Should, like, I don't have to worry. I have to worry, but maybe I shouldn't be so hard on myself, right? Am I the smartest mm. guy on the planet? Definitely fucking not. I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I have a yeah, lot of exactly. work to do. Am I the most confident man on the planet? Maybe. <laughs> but probably not. <laughs> right? There's, no. there's a, always a bigger I fish. Am. 100% I am. Most confident yeah, person yeah. ever. Sure. Sure. I'm way more confident than you, dude. And you know what else? I'm more <laughs> humble than you. I'm so <laughs> humble. I'm like... If there's the most humble man on the planet, it's got to be me. I'll tell you what. No, I'm kidding, man. False humility <laughs> is cringe. False I humility agree. is cringe. Modesty is cool. Modesty is fine. Like being reasonable about your abilities and saying, well, these are like, this is what I'm talented at. So this is what I should explore. These are the endeavors I should um, follow through. And this is mm -hmm. what I'm bad at, right? And that's fine because. You are just one person. You don't you don't make up the complete picture of humanity. You only you don't even make up like a smidge of the puzzle of humanity. You're you're like a you're like less than a dot in the blink of the world's eye. And it's mm -hmm. like you're a bug on the windshield of life. Like yeah. you're not that important. You're not as important as you think you are. You're yeah, really you not. Think, but the time the time frame of like one like the length of your life versus all of history. Yeah, it's like it's a second on the clock. It's yeah, a blink of an eye. Even even less, I think. Like even less than a second. It's like a millisecond. Mm -hmm. If you look at if you're talking like way way back, but um, yeah. But you're also way more important than you think you are. So it's, it's a little contradictory, but I'll explain. So in the grand scheme of things, you're literally a bug on the windshield of life. You are absolutely not as important as you think you are. You will likely not be a historical figure. You will likely not be remembered in not even a hundred years. You will likely have your kids and, and they'll have kids and they'll have kids and you'll, they'll probably forget about you by the third or fourth generation, right? And that's fine. But you're also extremely important. You're, the, you're way more important than you think. And that's because you are here today. You're here right now in the present. Why are you here right now? The answer doesn't really matter. I'll tell you why. Regardless of the answer, you're fucking here. Like you are here. There's mm. nothing you can do about that. Other than make it the best it can be while you're here. I was watching... Um, the Dead Poets Society the other day. We need to make a movie list, actually. We'll remind each other, but we should make a idea. movie list for guys to watch to get them to grow a little bit of balls on their sack, <laughs> a little bit of hair on their sack. Um, but we need to make a movie list for guys to so they yeah. can see, like, what, what is the example? What is the exemplar male? How can we look up to these people? How can we become like them? How can we idealize them so we can reach up to the highest point? Obviously, without it goes without saying, the highest ideal is Christ, and it's bar none, no one comes close. But how Absolutely. can we, how can we reach stepping stones to get to that point? And I think Dead Poet Society is a great example, right? The teacher who comes back essentially challenges the status quo of the education that these kids have been getting at this prestigious private school, and he's saying, "Don't neglect your studies. Don't." act as if they're not important but if there is something that's so important to you that your studies and other parts of your life must be neglected because your whole like i said your whole essence is screaming at you to do the thing mm. then it must be done and nothing should stand in your way and that starts with small decisions right it starts with small difficult conversations especially usually with your parents Sorts of small, difficult conversations with your friends, other members of your family, you know, you not being able to do something or your activities not being approved by other members of society should not drive you to suicide, which spoiler alert, unfortunately happens in the movie. I think men tend to think that there's almost no one, even if they've had a very difficult life and maybe they do have no one currently in their life. 
that agrees with them or accepts them. Men tend to think that there will be no one in their life. And, and I think the way that the reason it happens is the easiest way to put it is women are women just are right. They exist in the moment. They're much more present. They think a bit less mm. about the past and a bit less about the future. I think in general, and I think data does support that. And that's why they're better managers at daily things, but, but yeah. generally tend to be worse at big picture items. Whereas men can almost be purely big picture. And men tend to look purely at future yeah. and past rather than that's present, me. which is a problem. Yeah, that's because my problem, you you 100%. need to remember where you are. Like, pinch me, I'm dreaming. Yeah, pinch me, I'm having a fucking nightmare. Like, remember <laughs> that you're here, that you are here right now. And it's and the reason why men are becoming is because they're always thinking in ideas of potentiality, and the fact that men get driven to suicide so much more than women is very telling in the idea that these men who do commit suicide think that there is no more potential for them to be had. And to you, I say, you are wrong. You will always be wrong. Your life can be the worst it's ever been, and it can get worse. Mm. But because it has the potential to get, wor get worse, guess what? Harvey Dent flipped the coin, and it has the potential to be better. And maybe sometimes people are at a point where they say, I know it has the potential to be better, but I don't care. And that's when you really die. I think that's when mm. you really, that's when your soul gives out to the dying light. That is when you can no longer rage against it. That is when you said, my life is complete. And that is that you haven't said, I will slowly incrementally change for it to improve because it's difficult. You haven't said, I will extremely change to make it better. You've said, I'm not going to try anymore. And when you stop trying, I promise you, that's when you die. You can come back to life. You can, you can be revived by something else that causes you to, to realize that you shouldn't have never stopped trying. But once you get into that mindset, well, guess what happens? You become more dead and more dead and less living and more dead. And eventually you just die. So never stop trying. Never stop deciding to be noble. And I actually have a poem about a, a poem specifically about this, the idea of like, even though things are hopeless, like completely hopeless, does not mean you should stop trying and trying to do better. And the poem is called The Charge of the Light Brigade by Lord Alf. I think it's Lord Tennyson Alfred or Lord Alfred Tennyson. But anyways. You may have heard it in the blind side. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them. Volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabering the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke. Shattered and sundered, then they rode back, but not. Not the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them. Cannon behind them volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death. Back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them left of 600 when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honor the charge they made honor the light brigade noble 600 Ooh, that gave me goosebumps that gave that me goosebumps yeah that was a good poem and and this is the idea this is what we're saying 
there is there is certain fear that is so bewildering and so irrational and yet you can still overcome it you can still be someone who exits the mouth of hell that you chose to jump into right this is the interesting part about this they chose to not retreat they chose mm. to charge forward how many of them fell probably like 500 out of the 600 one and thing they, uh, they won. i just started thinking about during that was how much easier it is to overcome fear when you're standing among other men who are also willing to overcome that fear that's what i was saying at the beginning big, big key major that's key. what i was saying at the beginning major key you must surround yourself with the men who you would like to be more like and vice versa mm -hmm. Do That's not why you said yourself. you yeah. don't want to be friends with these guys who are going to be cowards. No, I don't like being friends with cowards. And my old friends. It's one hundred percent true. My old friends were cowards, and I, I fail to see it any way they will change their life in a meaningful way. I may be forgotten, but at least I chose not to try to be. That is the point here. Mm. And if your friends are unfortunately like that, I'm going to warn you right now: if you decide to change and grow. You will leave them behind. It may seem like they're leaving you behind, but it's actually the opposite. You've moved mm. forward. They have recognized that as a contradiction to the existence of your group. And they say, we don't want someone who's different than us anymore. And does that make you wrong for being different, for being better? No, not at all. Quite the contrary. It actually makes you good. Mm -hmm. To overcome the friends that have potentially held you back from being the person you could be. Well, it's dangerous because, well, I can never find friends again. But the reality is, you and anyone else listening to this podcast, you and anyone else who's willing to improve yourself, improve your station in life, you will find a friend somewhere. You absolutely will find a friend. You will find someone who loves you and cherishes you as well for who you are. As long as you're Remember, actually willing to attempt to be that person, that's the point. Remember the, the the actual definition of I don't know if it's the actual definition, but whatever, I made it up. The uh, the <laughs> definition of, of a toxic person is a person mm -hmm. who has like a total aversion to anything of any any type of improvement for themselves or someone else mm -hmm. so when, as you're improving themselves if they think that's cringe you're like oh you're 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 working out that's that's stupid mm -hmm. it's like oh you're you're trying to learn this new language why that's stupid oh, oh you have a renewed faith in jesus christ why that's that's, <laughs> that's gay uh it's like actually no you're gay bro you're, gay, you're toxic bro. you're toxic <laughs> because you're the one who's who's trying to bring me down mm -hmm. Because they're right. they're too afraid of what they could become, and they're afraid that when you become that thing, they're going to feel bad. So that's why they reject you. And I think like uh, the biggest the biggest litmus test to see if your friends are really those type of people who want to become better is the porn question. Is the oh, hey guys, so I'm gonna, it's so true. I'm gonna stop watching porn, and they go, what? Why? Because for I think for as many men who, who want to stop and they try to stop and they know it's bad for them, the same amount just don't care. They yeah. could not care less how much damage it can do to them. They could not care less of the of the disorder that they're taking part of. And the people who listen to this podcast, well, I am challenging you today to be that person. Right? This is freedom. February. We said freedom, freedom February. I know we haven't really, that's been the theme for the moment. I don't think we even men mentioned that yet. <laughs> we may have not mentioned it, I, but I hope you can assume literary but, themes yeah. that we use based on our topics. The whole idea is freedom February. And if you aren't willing to break free from the shackles of addiction, from the shackles of toxic friends, toxic relationships, potentially toxic family members, not again, not throwing them to the wayside, but recognizing the evil and what it causes you to become rather than becoming who you should be. That is who I want listening to this podcast. That yeah. is what freedom February is all about. 
yeah, I think that's a good place to end it here. Right? Mm-hmm. It's a good episode. Uh, one thing I just want to add just on the end here. Um, it's kind of like a personal experience. Let's just be quick. Um, when I was a kid, I was like anxious all the time about things like mostly uh, social anxiety. And I ended up going to like the a counselor a couple mm-hmm. times for it. And uh, the way I actually got over it was not because of the counselor. I just sort of decided that uh, having anxiety was, was kind of cringe, kind of gay. <laughs> And then a, I just yeah. stopped. I just stopped having it. So, that's uh, some something to try. Something to try if that's uh, an issue for you. And it could be applied to anything as well. Yeah, and I I think I'll add, just add quickly here too that, you know, I there's no shame in being weak. There is absolutely shame in staying weak. So, you know, whatever you need to do to make yourself mentally stronger, um, emotionally stronger, physically stronger take on those endeavors, although they may seem embarrassing. If you come out of it a stronger man, well, trust me, you aren't the person who should be embarrassed. It should be those who denigrate you for trying to become better. Mm. Well said. A man that flies from his fear may find that he has only taken a shortcut to meet it. J.R.R. Tolkien.